like a loud thunder and it shook the building. It seemed like uh, the bowels of hell opened up. Wrong storm, wrong place, worst time. I told Julie, be ready for some type of emergency. I was really panicked at that point, but kept grabbing. And when we saw that, I said, oh my God, call 911. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. Saturday, March 6, 2004, Baltimore. Bob Williams and his girlfriend Julie Lauer are standing near a dock along the city's historic harbor. They've been sightseeing at Fort McHenry, the 18th century stronghold famous for inspiring the Star Spangled Banner. But darkening skies make them think twice about staying. There was noticeable difference in the weather. It had gotten dark, real dark, and then there was, there was some lightning that I pointed out to Julie. The Baltimore natives know the best way back home is by boat, a one-mile trip directly across the harbor. They're at the head of the line when it's time to board the ferry service called Seaport Taxi. You could see kind of the storm coming up, but you just, you know, you never think anything bad's going to happen. Across town, WMAR-TV meteorologist Justin Burke is expecting something to happen. He's watching a line of thunderstorm activity move toward Baltimore. The storm's 50 mile an hour wind gusts are not unusually strong. What strikes Burke is how quickly the system is moving. Our time lapse camera showed sunshine, dark cloud, heavy rainfall, and then it's gone. The sun comes back out. I mean, it was really that quick. That speed means the storm will catch many people by surprise, especially the hundreds along the low lying harbor. If you're outside and you weren't facing due west, if trees, buildings, anything was obstructing your view, you had very little warning that that storm was on the way in. The people at the Fort McHenry Pier have no idea how strong the approaching storm is. Their view to the west is obscured by the rising landscape. But they can see some clouds gathering, so they're eager to take shelter aboard the seaport taxi called Lady D. These 36-foot pontoon boats can transport only 23 passengers and two crew members. Today, the boat is packed with families, including Andrew Rochella, Corinne Schillings, and their parents. Andrew and Corinne are both 26 years old. They met in college and have been dating ever since. It was very sweet and loving, and it was it was really nice to hear her talk about him because, you know, you definitely knew that the two of them were meant to be. Corinne's parents, Denny and Karen Schillings, are visiting from Illinois. They're celebrating Corinne's recent acceptance into a master's program in international studies. She loved to learn a new language. So she ended up speaking four languages, you know, French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. She really found it fascinating to do those kinds of things and learn about other cultures and, and other people. Andrew is from Northern Virginia so his parents didn't have to travel far to join the group. Andrew had such a similar loving home environment like Corinne grew up and so it, it always seemed to us they were sort of naturally pulled together. Now the young couple is on the verge of marriage. Corinne doesn't know it, but Andrew is planning to propose. I always used to say to her, you know, what's his phone number? I need to call this boy and tell him just to do it already. Um, and she'd say, no, you know, he's gonna do it when he's ready. The rain starts just before 4 p.m. as the Lady D pulls away from the dock. The storm had, boy, it, it was over us at this point. Passengers on board immediately feel the force of the weather. I just remember it being windy and the boat rocking. The mood changed from caution and concern to shortly thereafter the, uh, a sense of panic. A hundred yards from the seaport taxi dock, a group of naval reservists is wrapping up a day of training at the reserve center. Master Chief Melvin Johnson and Senior Chief Vincent Scardina are standing in the doorway watching the amazing change in the sky. We were looking at the clouds, they looked very ominous, and then we heard this boom like a loud thunder and it shook the building. 
it seemed like uh, the bowels of hell opened up because we had these thunderclaps coming, we had dark clouds, we had 30, 40 knot winds coming out of nowhere. There was a rain and a mist moving in over the water. And that's when we happened to look over there and see the uh, our water taxi. About 300 yards from shore, the seaport taxi seems to be heading back toward the fort to take refuge from the storm. That is like, I'm not believing this. They don't belong out there. They're too small. They're too light. The officers watch as the boat turns and is broadsided by wind gusts estimated at 50 miles an hour. That's what I said, oh my God, I don't think he's going to make it. It was swaying the boat back and forth, and, and you could tell you could tell immediately that the, the captain was having a hard time keeping control of the boat. Aboard the taxi, Bob Williams knows they're in danger. He turns to Julie Lauer and gives her a critical message. I really grabbed her by the shoulders to make sure she was, she was understanding me very clearly. He had both hands on my shoulders and said that, you know, this could be serious. I then showed her how the, the windows open and closed, just in case something were to happen and we needed to get out of the boat. I watched him open and close them, and I could see by the look on his face that, that he was serious and, you know, wasn't just joking around. Julie barely has time to take in the information before another gust of wind crashes into the side of the boat. One of the pontoons rises out of the water. Within seconds, yet another strong gust delivers a violent push, proving too much for the boat. The water taxi capsizes. All 25 people aboard tumble through the cabin. I just remember hearing the, the side of the boat smacking up against the water. It felt like I was in something round, that just going around and around with my hands grabbing. What was the floor is now the ceiling, and the windows, which were at uh, head level, are now basically the, the bottom of the boat. The frantic passengers and crew take one more breath before the icy brown water rises over their heads. Everything inside the cabin goes dark. We were all trapped in the boat, and it was, it was just a matter of survival at that point. Get out of the boat. On shore, the naval reservists are astonished by what they see. And I said, oh my god, call 911. Senior Chief Scardina uses his cell phone while running toward the Navy boat that's docked at the Reserve Center's pier. This is Armor City 911. 18 other reservists are right behind him. He said there's a uh, boat overturned, one of the uh, boats they have there. We got the 911 call out, and then guys just showed up at the gate. The gate opened, and we flooded onto the boat. Two doors down, another group of rescuers is mobilizing. City firemen at the department's fireboat house have also seen the taxi flip over. Bobby Seebeck and his partner, Bart Coey, run to their boat. You could see an overturned vessel with people hanging on the bottom of it. We were out the door before our alarm even went off. Car rescue boats, there are people in the water. It's not the pier. Inside the overturned taxi, Julie Lauer is underwater, trying to remember what her boyfriend, Bob Williams, showed her about the windows. She feels her way through the coffee-colored water, desperately trying to open one. I was really panicked at that point, but kept grabbing. I just remember just feeling an opening and hoping my head was going to come out. Julie doesn't know where Bob is, or even if he's still alive. Using the last of her breath, she swims in total darkness toward what she hopes is the way out. She can't see anything, so you just had to hope and pray that, that you were right. Still underwater, Bob is trying to escape through a window before he drowns. There was such panic on the boat or inside of that cabin to get out that just even though I was able to, to open a window, I, I couldn't get through it. Just as Bob is about to run out of breath, he finds another open window. Within seconds, he rises to the surface. As soon as my head comes above water, my focus shifts back to Julie and just the panic of, of where's Julie. And uh, fortunately, it only took about a second and a half or so to uh, see her also out in the harbor. When I saw him, and it was just, I mean, I can't even describe that feeling. It was just 
so relieved.